Uh, and uh, now we have our final session. Um, Balash Alante of Korea University will present on um, MENA related foreign policy. Uh, let me see if I can get the title. Sorry, Balash. Um, North Korean discovers the Maghreb propaganda narratives in the formative phase of Pyongyang's Northwest African diplomacy, <laughs> or just MENA foreign policy, as I just called it. Um, so, Balash, if you could present for 20 minutes, um, and then we will. Then uh, John will uh, be act as discussant, uh, and we should finish. What's what's our finishing time tonight? Five. Five. We're going to finish at five, and then and then we'll then we will have closing closing remarks, wrap up, tears, commemorative. We, we should get some commemorative photos as well. Okay. Um, so yes, please, Balaj, take it away. I will act as uh, Balaj. What was that? Okay. Uh, sit down, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, if everyone is now seated, uh, oh, oh. and Kevin is now seated. Okay, take it away. Can you hear me now, Matthew? No, no, can't hear you. It's not on. It's not on. <laughs> The buttons at the front, oh, buttons front. Okay, now. Okay, now it's better, sorry. <laughs> okay, so first of all, I need some sort of justification because it's very easy, you know, to start a presentation saying, oh, this particular subject has not been covered by others before, and it's a crying shame that nobody did it. And of course, definitely it's a crying shame in Korean studies, nobody ever wrote a monograph about North Korean opinion about Antarctica. <laughs> Can you prove that anybody ever did? See, so of course I could adopt this approach and it's very easy to do, but I tried uh, to present some more important argument in favor. And the first I would like to mention, that uh, Algeria specifically was some really important actor in North Korean diplomacy, especially in the 1970s, when North Korea wants to join the non-aligned movement, they absolutely needed Algerian support to get inside. And in fact, it enabled Algeria to blackmail North Korea and force them to recognize the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic which no other socialist country was recognized, willing to recognize around that time. So it is definitely something interesting if you look at the literature that we have a lot of publication relatively on North Korean relations with Iran and Syria and sometimes Libya, a little bit about Egypt, but this particular part region of the Arab world is kind of neglected. And from this example, you can see from the Algerian example, it's not because it was not important for North Korea. So it's a little bit a kind of uh, like tricky question why it was kind of still overlooked, even though people kind of recognized that it was important, but still they did not study it in depth. And the second reason why I feel there is some reason to look into this matter, that through these concrete examples, we can understand something deeper about North Korean development, the development of North Korean diplomacy. Because in the narratives, even now recently, very recently, after the archival sources became often much more accessible than any time before, we still have this image about North Korea, which is reproducing the North Korean narrative, that North Korea was kind of especially successful in gaining the friendship of developing third world countries, non-aligned countries. And they also had some sort of like, uh, like attraction to North Korea. And it's really interesting to look into this matter, how much this narrative is true, truthful, and how much it's some sort of retrospective and manipulated one. So to mention kind of one very concrete example, 
that usually in this narrative, North Korea is implicitly or even explicitly contrasted with East Germany. East Germany being a Soviet-dominated country, not doing anything like too much independently. And North Korea is like the Juche foreign policy and everything. And then people draw the conclusion, North Korea must have been like more successful in gaining the friendship of developing countries. This is also a non-European country, non-white country, former colonized country, independent mind country, all that. And if you look into an hyper, in fact, what we see that in many of the Arab countries, the first gains and footholds are made by the East Germans overtaking North Korea. Algeria is a very interesting ex exception to this rule, and we are going to look into this matter. But I would like to start by emphasizing this point, because it shows that the logic of these countries is also very important to understand. It's not enough to look at them from a current perspective. We should look into their own motivations and how they decide to pick friends and why they are attracted to one country or less attracted to another. So having said that, I also would like to mention one more thing in this matter, that which is also a matter of greater importance, that how exactly North Korean worldview, North Korean policy, North Korean thinking became independent from the original Soviet model, which they kind of got implanted. Because it's very much of like a political sensitive question, and sometimes people try to trace back this independent thinking, even in the early 50s or even before, Sometimes they deny it as long as possible. So it's very interesting to look into this matter, that when North Korea is trying to form an opinion about countries which we, with which it never had any historical connection, like Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, how they discovered them for themselves, how they form an opinion, how their like ideas and images are different from other socialist countries. So to start with the first example, for which I presented some like statistical example here, I looked into how Nodong Shinmun covered the North African countries to niche. Is it on the slide? A little bit more, yes. Yes, a little bit more. Yes, this is it. So when North Korea looked at these countries, Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria, and how they covered them, and especially how often they published articles about them. Now, of course, this looks a very dry statistical analysis. But to make it more understandable, I would like to point out a few basic things. First of all, if you can see the years, this is 1951-52. This is a time when the Korean War is going on, the whole country is totally devastated, bombed by the Americans. They have probably the most horrible experiences of the whole history. And in this very period, Nodong Shinmun keeps writing like crazy about Tunisia and Morocco, how they are oppressed by the French. Now, this is something which is a little bit different, difficult to understand why exactly this was so important for the North Korean working peasantry and working class, what is happening in Tunisia at that time. It's getting a bit more Easy, be easier to understand if you compare it with the statistics of the East German party newspaper Nice Deutschland. It is look would look even better on some sort of graph because if you look deeper, you can see that not only the years but even the months are more or less overlapping. Whenever the East Germans write a lot about this or that particular country, usually North Korea does. When the East Germans feel it's not necessary, the North Koreas also don't cover it well. It would be kind of, of course, unreasonable to assume that the North Koreans looked at East Germany 
the very logical explanation, both of them looked at Pravda. And I could have added Pravda to the list with a problem that some Pravda issues are missing from my collection and I could never get them. So otherwise I can I cannot present a whole full set of statistics, but what I found is totally matching it. Usually Pravda is first, and a few days, sometimes a few weeks later, the others follow suit. Okay, now this is important for our big friend. It must be important for us. Then they are not interested, goes down. So this is first very important point. It shows that when North Korea starts forming an opinion about these countries and what sort of things are happening there, they are very much influenced by the whole Soviet bloc Locke's official position on that. The second and more interesting detail is that actually not only during the Korean War, even after the Korean War, the North Koreans are actually lagging behind East Germany in several respects. Slower to respond, less to write about these countries, and less detailed. So we absolutely don't see that because North Korea is a non-European country, former colonial country, they show a stronger interest in this, you know, uh, colonial countries, more the opposite. They rather react in a way where it's very far away and we have our own troubles and things like that. For the Germans, it's much more like more important than topical matter partly because they have their own oriental, you know, studies going back for many years, partly because it's a problem of the French and France is very important from a German perspective. So we can see from this that in practice, when North Korea starts forming an opinion about these countries, it's first very much reflecting the general Soviet bloc narrative and it's not getting like something more than that, rather less than that. Even compared to some other East European countries, they are first less interested. We have our own troubles. This is the logic, probably. What we can see when they first starting to diverge from this pattern and doing something different from the East German or, say, Hungarian pattern, this first you can like notice around 58. And then it comes very much uh, similar parallel to the Chinese logic. What the Chinese uh, think and say about this or that problem, many ways North Korea is reproducing it. Like for example, recognizing the provisional government of Algeria in September 58, which the Soviets, the East Europeans are unwilling to do, but the Chinese do. And after it, North Korea follows suit and also North Vietnam follows suit. So this is the first time when you notice that North Korea adopts a more radical attitude than the Soviet bloc and more like actively interested in doing something which they are not willing to do, but still, if you compare North Korea with, say, North Vietnam or China, again, it's a little bit lagging behind. Like, for example, when the new provisional Algerian government sends delega delegations uh, to China, North Vietnam in 1958-59, at that time, they still don't send it to North Korea as well, only to these two countries. Vietnam being a former French colony before, so this is a kind of special importance. Only 1960, first time they send it to North Korea. And there is a document in, translated, as far as I remember, by Pierre Asselin, and it's available in the Wilson Center Digital Archives, quoting the Algerian government making a memorandum from 1960 that which foreign countries we should consult before making an important decision. And they make a list of all Arab countries, the Soviet Union, China, and Vietnam. No school, no, sorry, not important enough. <laughs> so this is important to keep in mind because 
intellect richer, then you would see statements like that, you know, very freely, you know, thrown around that all and North Italian Algerians were extremely grateful from this recognition. Or you find that after North Korea recognized the Algerian government, it very much helped them to establish contacts with the Arab countries. No, sorry. <laughs> this happening in 58, and it starts only in the 60s, around 63 or later, when the other Arab countries are willing to do anything with North Korea. So this is a kind of very nice narrative. Unfortunately, the facts don't support it. So, to mention some more details, which are really important here, that the North Koreans do adopt this approach, like the Chinese, that if we have some sort of like, you know, armed struggle in this area of the world, it is useful and better than some sort of negotiated process. Well, you can understand why. From this, for the Soviets who had diplomatic relationship with France, for the East European countries who had a diplomatic relationship with France, the idea of provoking the French was not really necessarily a good idea. For the North Koreans, so who cares? <laughs> we have no diplomatic relationship with the French, so what? So. You can see a very interesting example in 59, when first Charles de Gaulle makes a kind of very conditional and cautious, but still important step forward, saying that like self-determination for Algeria, it is possible if this and this. Like, for example, we are going to have a referendum after several years, and then this, this is, but still self-determination. It's mentioned as a possibility, as a right, as an option, which is, of course, for the French ultras, it's a horrible idea. No, this is our for you know, the uh, three departments, you know, it's, it's our part of our country. This is the start when they start preparing for killing him as you know from the day of the jackal so in this matter it's very interesting that when the french make this kind of announcement the goal makes it at first the fln the algerian liberation front is kind of ambiguous on the matter and also the other communist countries first wait out but then in October, like mid, a little bit after mid-October, the Chinese first finally forcefully came out and said, it's a lie, it's a trick, it's deceit, reject it. And then a little bit later, Khrushchev himself declares, oh, it's a good, ex a good uh, initiative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the North Koreans now see two to, to the different approach to the whole thing. A little bit still, they, they still wait. In November, they come out. It's a trick. It's a lie. <laughs> so you can see from that, they don't openly say we support the Chinese. They don't openly say we reject the Soviet approach. But in practice, you can very clear, clearly position them. So I mentioned this example that, that also another example I may add that when the Algerian uh, uprising or revolution insurgent starts in 54, first thing the North Koreans mention about it, what the Algerian Communist Party said about the matter. Now, first of all, this is what Pravda quoted also. Second problem is uh, the Algerian Communist Party was not involved in the uprising, but who cares? <laughs> For the uh, North Korean logic, the Algerian Communist Party is the authoritative stores. The fact that it was actually started by the, you know, Front of National Liberation, which made their own announcement, no, no this is not quoted, this is not important. So you can see from these examples that when North Korea starts making an opinion about these things, in many ways it is reflecting what the other communist countries, the role models or others say about it. 
And the way they diverge, it's often a bit like conservative way. I am less interested or I'm kind of more aggressive radical. Like, for example, when Morocco is being uh, decolonized and getting its independence in 1956, March 56, you can see the start of the process in 55 when the French allowed the Sultan Mohammed V to return from exile. Then the East German party newspaper publishes like 10 or more articles about it. That's a very great, important event. North Koreans don't match. Well, bloody few, the ruler doesn't important, not, not important. So you can really feel this kind of thing that when the North Koreans make an opinion about these countries, it is often a sort of like reproduced opinion, but was a very selective one. To mention one more example, I mentioned Algeria, I mentioned Tunisia, now uh, Morocco. Now let's mention a Tunisian example, which is probably even more interesting. It also shows that how difficult dilemmas North Korea sometimes had to face when looking at these countries. So in 50, uh, 57, uh, Tunisia gets into conflict with the French or the sort of border incidents. And then to try to find some counterweight against French pressure, they ask for some military equipment from the United States, which of course makes the French extremely angry that why the bloody Americans poke their nose into our private business. It's of course an independent country, Tunisia, but for the French, it's still part of our empire in this mentality why the Americans should intervene. It's been 20 minutes. Okay. So, <laughs> sorry. I could uh, totally like miscalculated. So the point is, when it happens uh, that uh, Tunisians do something which is really not fitting into the model, like they have a quarrel with Nasser of Egypt, they have a conflict with, uh, like, for example, the FLN, then the North Korea totally go into silent mode. When there is a territorial dispute between Morocco and Mauritania, again, the North Koreans go into totally silent mood, which is very different from, say, the East Germans who would mention that, oh, there is a problem, and then they either try to take a stand or they kind of bit evasive, but they do mention. The North Koreans usually have this kind of logic that, okay, if it's somehow not fitting into our worldview, then it doesn't exist. And so the final example I would like to say to wrap up my presentation, which is very telling in many ways, because even in terms of theoretical matters, it's an important example. How North Korea is writing about these countries and how much their own thinking is also a reproduction of something else. So what I saw, thanks to friends who found it for me, in the North Korean Great Chosun Encyclopedia, if you look up their, their entries about, say, Morocco or Algeria, they also have a section about describing the history of these countries. According to the North Korean version of history, at the history of Morocco started with the French and Spanish inc incursions into the country. <laughs> the fact that there was something else before, well, it's not mentioned, not, not important. Now, it's a kind of unbelievable insult to Morocco, you know, because they're very proud that they were independent even from the Ottoman Empire. But it's not feudal, tribal, whatever, not important. But and this is the final twist to the story. This is precisely what you find in the East European newspapers starting like around 46, 47, 1950, when they write about Korea. Well, 
history of Korea started with Japanese colonization. <laughs> Japanese colonial rule gets like two sentences or one, maybe two if we are generous. Then, okay, the Soviets liberated the country very well. <laughs> now, this is the important point. <laughs> if Korea had anything else to do, well, we don't know from the newspaper because it's not important. <laughs> So now North Korea is kind of repaying the favor, you know, to the poor colonized country. Okay, you, your history starts with the French. <laughs> okay, so here I'll finish it, and thanks a lot for the project. Okay, uh, so thank you very much, Balesh, for that presentation. Impossible for me to follow with the PowerPoint, so the PowerPoint was a complete mess. Uh, next time, please just bark orders at me. Treat me like a, a running boy, and I will quite happily... Uh, yeah, I will be a running dog for your presentation. Um, what was that? Okay. Running cat, yes. Uh, Balaj is a massive cat lover, so he doesn't like any uh, dog metaphors. <laughs> so it's a dogalogue, not a catalogue, right? Oh, yes. Uh, so the, the man on the left is also a crazy cat lover. How many cats do you have, John? I have 27. What? You had at home? Well, I, I had a, a sort of two-acre garden. And... <laughs> He's 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 like the male version of the crazy cat woman from The Simpsons, isn't he? Um, so J John Everard, a uh, former uh, ambassador to North Korea, DPRK. Um, it's at the British, former British ambassador to DPRK, rather than the North Korean ambassador to Britain, right? I'm correct. Yeah, I just want to make sure that's correct. Um, uh, now, uh, now an independent scholar, man about town, um, expert on all things North Korean. Uh, it will be Balaj's discussant. Um, I'll give you ten minutes. Um, well, thank you, Peter. Many thanks. That was a, a, a fine presentation. Full disclosure, uh, I have long been a, a great admirer of Balash's work. Uh, for those who haven't come across him before, Balash has done everybody uh, in the Korean studies field a huge service by making available uh, the fascinating co uh, correspondence of the Hungarian embassy in Pyongyang over many years available to a, a much wider audience. It's, if you haven't read this material, I do commend it to you. It's a, an extraordinary insight into the way that North Korea actually worked at the time. So I, I claim no objectivity. When I was asked to, uh, to, to be the discussant for this session, I was expecting an excellent paper. And sure enough, we got one. As Balash put it out at the beginning, uh, nobody's written about this before. Uh, we, we, you know, he'd rather like you know, one of these early explorers wandering through a jungle, sort of working out what is going on. Um, I thought the result was was really quite intriguing. Uh, I, I, I think the paper is an important contribution to the history of writing in its own right. Uh, but also, I was intrigued by the analysis of the different pressures uh, under which North Korean foreign policy works. You'll have noticed that uh, extensive references there to the sequencing of articles in Prague, you mentioned Balash, Neuss Deutschland, and then uh, Roden Schindmann. And you do get the sense that we have the, the policy making elite in Pyongyang sitting there. So looking at this map of the world and countries that they were never going to visit, uh, of whose cultures they had only the, the sketchiest grasp, but they knew that they were somehow politically important. They're looking for a lead and were trying to work out whose lead to follow, you know, China's, the Soviet Union's, and, and so on. And so you get this, uh, the, 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 the series of articles about the, uh, uh, the, the, the Maghreb in its different constellations. Um, I, uh, and I thought that the, the shifts in the, 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 the policy focus that uh, Balas has brought out in his paper were really quite fascinating. Uh, could I, incidentally, uh, at this point, also commend the paper's methodology? Uh, the subject that Balas has treated here is not just pretty much virgin territory. It's also quite a difficult subject to tackle. Where do you start if you are trying to analyze uh, North Korean policy to uh, an area well on the periphery of North Korean foreign policy concerns some years ago. And I thought that the, uh, the, the very careful, very methodological, very, very methodical rather, approach that Balash took of charting the articles, sequencing them, articles, as he pointed out, uh, that appeared even when North Korea was actually fighting for its very existence, which says something about North Korean priorities. Uh, enables you to not only uh, see 
uh, the, the points, the, the peak points, as it were, of when North Korea is focused on these countries, but also, and this is a, a point I'm always trying to make to North Korean, to students in North Korea, it brings out the silences. When North Korea speaks, of course you listen, when it doesn't speak, you also need to listen. Mm -hmm. And Baris's chart does that admirably. Uh, as I say, I commend the methodology. Um, I think that the, uh, if, if I can go so slightly off piece here, uh, I, I, I'd be fascinated to know uh, what the mirror study would look like. If you went through the, uh, the, the FLN uh, journals at the time, thank you, before I knock it over, uh, or, or the Tunisian sort of near state journals, or, or that, how many times they would refer to North Korea in the same way as Baris has done for Rogu Shinwon looking at these countries. I have a hunch um, that the answer would be a very low number, that North Korea was important to these countries at certain moments. We, you saw flashed up there uh, the, 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 the relationship between Borgiva and, and Kim Il-sung, for example. But most of the time that we've been studying here, frankly, most of these countries didn't care what North Korea thought, probably didn't really know where North Korea is. So what you've got is the North Korean policy elite dancing this exquisite diplomatic minuet, uh, trying to work out what their position is, uh, following different leads uh, from different countries, which didn't actually intersect with reality at all for quite long periods. Pure abstract diplomacy. And a fascinating example of the, the kind of mismatch between North Korea's actual importance in the world mm -hmm. and its perceived, its self perceived importance. It insists in these matters in acting as if it were a major power, putting out these you know, great statements about uh, countries that are uh, a long way away, whereas actually nobody much is, is listening. And it's really just you know, the North Koreans talking to themselves. Um, in conclusion, I think we're out of time. Uh, all good soap operas leave their audience hungry for more. You all know more, don't you? Don't all start at once. Okay. Uh, yeah. The, the, for anybody out there who is looking for a PhD subject, and I, I can count the number of times that anxious students have come to me saying everything's being written about, sways of Virgin territory. What happened after? The period the balance has described. Uh, you could take it forward uh, into, you know, uh, into the 1990s. Uh, I, I have to say I have a particular interest in this question because sitting in Pyongyang, as I, I, I did for some time, I got quite friendly with the representatives of some of these countries, uh, the Syrians and the Libyans. Uh, the Libyans, incidentally, they, they may have a completely crazy regime. They do make great coffee. <laughs> uh, and at that stage, they were complaining to me that they were getting no attention at all anymore from the North Koreans. I got quite good access to the North Korean apparatus, the British ambassador. I could get a, a minister from time to time, a vice minister often. And if I wanted just to go and call on routine business, a director uh, in a North Korean department without too much trouble at all. If they got ahead of section, they were happy. And most of the times, the North Koreans just wouldn't answer the phone at all. So somewhere between you know, the, the kind of high points that Barrett has outlined in, in, in his paper and uh, 20, 2008, 2007, when I was there, we've, got, we've witnessed a great decline in this relationship. It'd be fascinating if anybody was taking the challenge to map out the course of that decline. Thank you. Uh, how many minutes do we have? Um, five? Ten? Okay. We've got ten minutes, uh, so the floor is now open. Uh, wave your hands uh, wildly, and I will um, happily. Um, does anyone have any questions? Can we make a very short comment to your remark about what happened out there? Just a curious episode, because we have this image, North Korea, the state sponsor of terrorism. Yeah. And we have this image, of course, Islamist terrorism being an enemy. Now, in the early 1990s, <clears throat> Algeria had a military dictatorship fighting against Islamist terrorism. 
what is your guess? What was North Korea's position in this matter? Yes, pro, pro the insurgency. No, they were training the Algerian special forces. Uh -huh. okay. And they're doing exactly the same period when Iran was breaking diplomatic relationship. No, the Algeria was breaking diplomatic relationship with Iran yeah. because the Iranians were sympathetic to the Islamists. So basically, North Korea is going crosswise to Iran on the Algerian back there yes. and basically supporting the military dictatorship to suppress the insurgency. So <laughs> the story they have to be told. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, it was was told because oh, yeah. there were um, French language memoirs by Algerian military men and it's mentioned there. It's a very interesting document. Um, oh, please. Yeah, thank you very much for the fascinating presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I think I remember reading somewhere, either in the footnote or, or a part of Pyongyang Times, that um, North Korea even invited this Algerian F FLN fighters to, the, to Pyongyang in the 1950s or the early 1960s to train their revolutionary ideology. Um, have you ever like a, um, seen any, any kind of articles that um, North Korea invited this, not Algerians, but Moroccan or Tunisian or other uh, countries in Maghreb or already in the mid 1950s or mid 1950s? This is very unlikely. But they met, uh, they had an um, FLN delegation coming in 1960. And they had the student delegation in 57. No delegation from Tunisia or Morocco. Actually, not needed for that because they had this really serious conflict with the French earlier. So this is kind of very unlikely. What they did too much later was when there is the Polisario insurgency in Western Sahara, and they probably gave some sort of assistance uh, to the guerrillas there which is a bit difficult to trace because if they give an assistance directly to the Algerians, it may still end up with Polisario. So sometimes it's a bit, bit difficult to figure out. But in that early period, most probably not. Even the Chinese and the Vietnamese were kind of like very cautious on this matter. And the Algerians are complaining that they are not getting enough from them how much they would prefer. So I very much doubt so. Can I add just one more question? Please. Um, yeah. And like my additional questions uh, is, uh, do you think whether this period of uh, North Korean communication or North Korean interest in Madrid is related to its um, further extension of um, Diplomatic relations with Guinea in '59 and Mali also in '59. Do you think this somehow related to this um, to Francophone countries, or it's something fully relevant? I would rather say that it it more it was an initiative from the other side because Sekoture is a very radical leader. There is this referendum, and Guinea is the only country not accepting the French communauté. Mm -hmm. So after it, when it has this really strength, straight, strong break with the goal, then he is reaching out to the communist countries, and North Korea is on the list. And uh, I think it's more because of his readiness to make a relationship with North Korea than North Korea would diplomatic ability. So I don't think it's a francophone thing. It's more like Sekoture um, being like excessively radical by uh, like post-colonial standards that he willing to do that. But it's true that also Mali itself established diplomatic relationship with North Korea in 1960. So he also happened to be francophone. So I think that to some extent, these countries were influenced by the Algerian example. Uh, this is probably true. But still, I feel that North Korea is just on the list. Usually, they 
when they establish diplomatic relationship with North Korea, they are also willing to do it with Vietnam and especially with the PRC. So the really interesting example is Algeria in the sense that they reverse the pattern you see in many Arab countries that they are kind of deliberately neglecting East Germany and favor North Korea because North Korea recognized us, but the bloody East Germans did not. So in this case, you can see some connection, but otherwise, singling out North Korea is not happening at that period yet. This is what important to emphasize that for many of these third world countries, we have this logic that first there are communist countries in general, but within communist countries, there are divided countries and there are no divided countries. Now, the Soviet Union is a superpower. We must have some relationship with it. The smaller countries are not necessarily important. We can ignore them. If we still want to have a relationship, better to do it with the Czechs, the Poles, the Hungarians, Romanians. The tricky thing is with the divided ones like Germany, Vietnam, Korea, Mongolia is also tricky because of the Chinese or Taiwanese claim to them. So we make distinction that we have the ambassadorial relationship with the four countries, maybe consular general relationship with the divided countries. So they are going lower and lower. And then sometimes we even make a hierarchy between the divided ones and okay, China is really big, Taiwan is small, okay, fine, we can favor the one. But if it's Vietnam and Korea and Germany, like a bit hands off. We have time for one more question. Yeah. It, it, I'm just uh, not so much. Uh, question, but anyhow, uh, because what you saw, it's if you look at the church, uh, the Korean annual, you see exactly the same picture. They did not have the ability to get intelligence about intelligence in a broad sense, um, about as a, a smaller countries. So, most Koreans, in most cases, when they were reporting about everything outside a small number of countries, like special groups, they basically as strongly suspect they did. What you described, they just look at what is said in China, in Soviet Union, maybe in Germany and Poland. So I see it's uh, probably it will be interesting to check other sort of secondary uh, regions of the secondary importance, and I strongly suspect we will see the same region. Okay. Um, well, uh, the final <clears throat> the final part of our schedule is uh, closing remarks and wrap up. So, Owen, if you'd like to deliver a 15, uh, 20 minute oration uh, no. on a topic of your choice. Should we just uh, yeah. pause? Now, um... Okay, yeah, right. The secret of that is that there is no uh, wrap up or closing Ooh. remarks. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, I think I should just say, um, in, unless unless Professor Lankov wants to come and make sort of uh, extended remarks of any kind, I think I can just say thank you very much to um, our speakers who came from far away and middle distance and some very much closer um and to our discussants also who i think all did um uh, an excellent job and really showed that they engaged um deeply with the with, with with the papers and i think added a lot actually because uh this kind of dialogue between uh, people is what makes something like this actually a valuable uh, occasion rather than just people telling you what they've been researching for the last uh, few years which is of course valuable as well um and uh thank you of course to everyone here for coming and and sticking it out as well on this quite long day um inside a basement at uh, at soas um good thing it's not a nice day outside isn't it because um, we're quite happy to be down here in the um cozy Khalili Theatre. Anyway, thank you very much to everyone for coming and um, I hope to see you in the future at a future Centre of Korean Studies events. Thank you.